uh, I am going to talk about the uh, history of personal media terminals as uh, briefly introduced. It uh, tells uh, how we have come uh, from uh, Walkman, which was uh, put in the market in 1979, uh, to uh, uh, most recent the Apple Watch, which, is, uh, which stays on your wrist. Okay, so I still need uh, this one to go forward. <laughs> yes. Yes. So uh, there is a famous old saying uh, which says, the fool learn from experience and the wise learn from history. So we should learn from the history uh, to do something in the future. So that's why I have just uh, prepared this presentation. Um, this slide shows uh, chip capacity versus data size after compression. So uh, the horizontal axis represents the time. Here is uh, 1980, uh, it's about 30 years ago, and uh, here is 1990, and uh, it co goes on along the horizontal axis. And the vertical axis here uh, represents the data size after compression because we need to compress a data size without losing its quality. Here I am talking about the audio data, but it is also true for video data. Um, so uh, in old times, you have this size of data. So it was not small enough, and then it keeps going down. That means technology uh, is well developed with time. At around 1990, there were these typical audio data compression algorithms. The first one is uh, AC2, which was developed by Dolby Corporation. And the second one is HRAP. This was uh, uh, the technology by Sony. The third one, PASC, uh, which was developed by, um, mainly by Philips, uh, which is now a health um, devices company in uh, Netherlands. But in those days, they were uh, doing a business, big business in consumer uh, electronics products. The last one here uh, is uh, MPEG. That is an international standard and the result of collaboration of uh, many companies and universities. In the second column here, I am showing the compression ratio, how much the data size uh, is reduced if you used uh, each algorithm. In the case of AC2, the ratio was uh, one sixth. A track by Sony, one fifth, passed by uh, Philips, uh, one fourth, and MPEG uh, from one fourth to even one twelfth. Uh, in the final column, I'm uh, showing the coding algorithms, but uh, it may not be a, a big interest here. So, in the blue trajectory, I am showing the memory capacity in a single chip. So as time goes on, the size of the memory has become bigger and bigger. So it started somewhere around here. And at the point near here, actually a couple of years after 1990, they met each other. That means the size after data compression was almost equal to the memory capacity on a single chip. What does it mean? It means that you can store the audio data after compression on a chip, not on any other media like uh, you know, um, compact disc or uh, audio tape or anything else. So it's a chip. That means everything can be put on a chip. That's what this figure means. Now, I have talked about MPEG in the last uh, uh, line in the previous page. MPEG is widely used now in our daily life, in your smartphone, in your uh, TV receivers, um, in your uh, car navigation systems, and even more. So I am going to briefly introduce uh, some MPEG standards, starting with MPEG-1. That is the first one, uh, which was uh, finalized in 1992 at the end of 1992, so it was almost 1993. MPEG-1 was actually developed uh, for these applications. Usually, uh, we wanted something uh, for game terminal for TV receivers. You used to uh, use this kind of device, which connects 
uh, is connected to your TV receiver to use it as a uh, game terminal. And then data is stored in digital media. So in that case, they wanted to put sufficient data, amount of data, so that you can enjoy interesting game, right? So that was the big motivation. Actually, this is a, uh, one of the products developed by NEC Corporation, which I worked for before uh, Yahoo. So that was a motivation. But it was later used also for uh, compact disks and the digital audio tapes and even magnetic hard, for even uh, magnetic hard disks. That was uh, MPEG-1. So the first audio uh, coding international standard. And then MPEG-2 came uh, because uh, uh, they wanted much uh, more efficiency. They extended MPEG-1 to cover multi-channel format, not only stereo. MPEG-1 uh, uh, could, could be used for stereo presentation. However, people wanted to cover even more channels, like uh, two, more than two, like three or four or five. Um, that was uh, the motivation to develop and standardize MPEG-2. I was missing something. Yeah. OK. So these, these, these were the primary uh, applications of MPEG-2. Uh, mostly used for um, home TV theater and the storage media like optical discs and the digital video uh, tape recorder, electric cinema, and uh, interpersonal communication such as Skype. Okay, so that was the motivation to develop uh, MPEG-2. But uh, even mo uh, a bigger application of MPEG-2 was uh, digital satellite uh, radio broadcasting in European countries. As you can easily, easily imagine, in, European, European, uh, in Europe, there are many countries, many small countries, many big countries. So they uh, had the need to uh, perform broadcasting in multiple different languages. That was the need for multiple channels. And it was used in, the, uh, in a consortium called the DRM or Digital Radio Mondial. So that was the motivation for MPEG-2. Uh, MPEG-2 had uh, uh, this kind of constraint called uh, backward compatibility. Backward compatibility means if you had an MPEG-2 decoder, you can still decode the main part of the MPEG-1 bitstream. OK? So it means that if you have a new system, you can still decode the main part of the bitstream generated by an old system. So it's, it, it's good. Backward compatibility is good. However, in another direction, if you look at it, it introduces some constraint from a viewpoint of the, the data compression algorithm. So sometimes it may not allow you to fully utilize new knowledge to provide much higher quality or much higher uh, compression ratio. So that was actually the case in MPEG-2. And there was a motivation to develop a new, yet new standard MPEG-2 AAC, or Advanced Audio Coding. AAC is uh, uh, an acronym for Advanced Audio Coding. This application, main application for MPEG-2 AAC was um, inter-broadcasting uh, station media transmission. It is not always easy to uh, uh, make uh, broadcasting programs at the local stations because sometimes it's uh, expensive. What they do at local TV stations or radio stations is to buy some already made programs from central and bigger radio or TV stations. In that case, they need to transfer or transmit the TV or radio program to those small radio or TV stations. In that case, it is very important not to lose the quality of the media. So um, media, for media content distribution between broadcasting stations, uh, 
there was a big demand uh, for new standard MPEG-2 AAC. The goal of this standardization or this standard MPEG-2 AAC was to provide transparent quality at a bit rate of 320 kilobit per second per five channels. So transparency means it is not possible to distinguish the quality between the original signal and the transmitted signal. In the pro process of transmitting, you apply data compression, you apply decompression of the data. So usually there, there are quant quantization noises. The quality is degraded, but even with this degradation, many people, most of the people should not be able to notice the degradation. That is the meaning of indistinguishability or transparency. Okay? And then uh, there was uh, MPEG-4 uh, came up. MPEG-4 was uh, standardized, developed and standardized for uh, mobile uh, terminal era. In those days, in uh, late mid to late 90s, uh, there was not smartphone available in the market. However, everybody was expecting it to come up, mobile phone handsets. The market was expected to uh, become bigger and bigger in those days. So preceding these days, MPEG-4 was developed and standardized. So applications include, but are not limited to, uh, these consumer products like the PCs or large screen uh, TVs, uh, mobile phone handsets, smartphones, uh, digital cameras, camcorders, and so on. So following MPEG-4, there was yet another standard that is uh, called MPEG-4 HEAAC. AAC is an acronym, as I said, Advanced Audio Coding. So what does HE mean? HE means high efficiency. So this standard is much more efficient than MPEG-4 AAC because it in introduces a technology called bandwidth extension. In bandwidth extension, you will transmit or utilize only the low frequency components. For the high frequency components, you actually do not transmit it, or you do not keep it in the memory. However, when you recover the original signal, you can extract the whole frequency components. So that's what bandwidth extension means. And this is very useful and widely used in your smartphone handsets like uh, uh, iPhones and uh, iPod, audio players in old days. Now uh, audio players are just a part of uh, smartphone functions. So that is MPEG-4 HEAAC. So developed for audio players and smartphones. The point is that the bitrate or the final uh, amount of data after compression is half of MPEG-4. However, the quality is the same. So that's what you get by this new standard. So let me talk about how the first audio standard, MPEG audio standard, was uh, born, birth of MPEG audio standard. MPEG-1 was standardized in early 90s, as I said, and there was a public call. So everyone uh, was it was possible for everybody to submit his or her own method or algorithm. There were over 40 uh, universities and companies submitted uh, their own method algorithms. However, it was too many. The number was too many to compare them to each other. So the chairman uh, suggested to make uh, these four groups. The first one is uh, called ASPEC. Uh, having uh, members of uh, AT&T Bell Laboratories in the U.S., DTB, Deutsche Thomson Brandt, that was a uh, uh, consumer electronics company in Germany. FHG is a uh, uh, half government-owned research institute in uh, Germany. This is actually still the giant in audio coding in the world today, even today. CNET was a uh, uh, research institute in France. The second group consists of Four Japanese companies. Uh, the group is called ATAC. The companies include uh, Fujitsu, JVC, uh, NEC, and Sony. The third group was called the Musicum. 
uh, having uh, members of IRP. This is a, a research institute uh, for broadcasting in Germany. Philips, this is a Nedal, uh, Dutch company for consumer electronics. CCETT is again a research institute in France, and Matsushita is a widely known uh, Japanese consumer electronics company. Matsushita has uh, just changed their brand, and now it's called Panasonic. The fourth group here is called the subband edge PCM, representing it, uh, its uh, algorithm. Um, the, the, the members are NTT, or Nippon Telephone and Telegraph Corporation, the biggest telephone operator in Japan, and the BTRL, British Telecom Research Laboratory. Uh, actually, British Telecom is the largest telephone operator in UK. So uh, there were comparisons. Uh, we just performed uh, subjective uh, evaluations and objective evaluations. Subjective evaluations, you can easily imagine. You simply invite uh, uh, tens of hundreds of uh, people and ask them to make uh, scores by listening to the uh, the, the audio signals after compression and uh, decompression or recovery. Um, objective evaluation was to measure the footprint in LSI implementation or estimate uh, uh, power consumption or other uh, factors um, clarified before the evaluation. So uh, from a viewpoint of a subjective quality, aspect was the best one, but from a viewpoint of objective quality, uh, Musicum was the best one. So it was not possible to uh, select only one candidate as the international standards here. So again, Chairman suggested to integrate these two methods. Um, and uh, finally, there are three algorithms in MPEG-1. The, the first two are la called uh, layers one and two based on Musicum. So uh, these algorithms are very simple, but uh, provide good quality up to one-fourth compression. Um, when you actually try to uh, apply much higher compression ratio, you need to uh, introduce uh, yet the new algorithm that is an integration of uh, aspect and the musical, the winners of this evaluation. Uh, this is called the layer three and also known as MP3. People may uh, say MP3 represents MPEG-3. That is wrong. There is no M MPEG-3 standard, as I will explain later. MP3 stands for MPEG-1 layer 3. Okay? It is also used as an extension for uh, file names. So this is an integration of uh, uh, aspect and the music. And then uh, uh, MPEG. Uh, standardization for uh, audio data compression continued on to MPEG-2 AAC, MPEG-4 AAC, uh, HE AAC with the bandwidth extension and uh, it's version 2 to cover stereo signals and even multi-channel uh, standard uh, called uh, MPS or MPEG, MPEG surround. So uh, if you look at the evolution of MPEG audio standards, it can be traced back to uh, late, late 80s, actually started in uh, December 1988 in uh, uh, Ottawa, Canada. That was the first meeting of MPEG. And then uh, first uh, standard was finalized in 92 as MPEG-1, and then continued on to MPEG-2, mainly developed in early 90s. And then mid 90s, uh, we worked on MPEG-2 AAC, uh, late 90s, we worked on MPEG-4 and then continued to uh, make the standard better and better and to fit the more recent um, requirements uh, by the society. So this uh, slide shows uh, applications of uh, MPEG audio. The standardization wa was uh, almost over in the, in the 80, 90s or even early uh, 2000. However, uh, we had to spend some time until the first uh, um, application actually uh, came into the market. The first application was a uh, ringtone uh, system in uh, early 2000. And uh, then it was started to uh, support audio players like iPod. The first iPod was uh, put in the market in 2001, 
and then a new, newer version was put in the market in 2004. And then in 2000, let me see, uh, it's somewhere around here, 2005, uh, there was the iPod Nano that was a complete uh, solid state version. Um, MPEG audio was uh, also used in uh, uh, 3GPP, that is uh, an institute to standardize mobile phone uh, communication protocols and the standards. Uh, so it is also used in uh, uh, streaming of uh, music and other audio signals in your mobile phone systems. Okay, uh, let's look at conventional audio players up to uh, 1990, long time ago. So there was Sony Walkman. Uh, Walkman was released in 1979. Uh, it was a personal entertainment system based on analog signal processing and analog <coughs> signal recording. So it suffered from noise. That was uh, the system in old days. And then we had the CD players or compact disc players uh, early in early 80s. The, this system was all digital. That is good, not analog. And the bandwidth was 20 kilohertz so that it covers most of the uh, audible frequency range of human beings. It was uh, possible to perform random access. Random access capability was provided by CD players. However, there was a mechanical movement in it. So there was something turning around like a motor. And if there was any shake or vibration given to this system from outside, and then it will cause skip of the signal. That was uh, the drawback. And then late, late 80s, there was a, a DAT, or a digital audio tape system. Um, in this case, it was lacking random access capability because it is based on the tapes. So to go forward or backward, you need to uh, rewind the tape system. So that's why uh, there was no random access capability provided and still based on magnetic, magnetic tape as storage, right? So rewind and fast forward was necessary to skip uh, the contents. Okay, so in summary, the drawbacks of all these uh, uh, audio, portable audio systems up to 1990 were weight too heavy, size too big, power, it doesn't last for a long time with the batteries, and reliability, that was true. So audio player with semiconductor memory was desirable because there was a potential to solve all these problems if you had all solid state audio player with semiconductor memory technology. That's why we developed the silicon audio in 1994. Uh, this shows a block diagram of encoding and decoding of the audio signal based on MPEG-1 and 2 technologies. Here is the input, audio input. I will not go uh, details of the processing here uh, because I understand that most of you are not the experts of uh, signal processing. But basically what they do is to perform analysis of the input signal frequency by frequency. And in each frequency uh, range, we apply different compression. Okay, so that's the, that's the key. And uh, when we decode the compressed signal to recover the original signal, we ap just apply the uh, processing in the reverse order so that we can uh, have the audio signal recovered at the output of the decoder. So that's what we do. Uh, this slide shows uh, memory capacity versus recording time. So here I have memory capacity in megabit, but uh, it may not be easy for you to understand uh, the memory capacity in megabit because you usually count it megabytes or gigabytes. Okay, so I am showing uh, the megabytes uh, scales here in green vertical lines, dashed uh, dash lines. Here, uh, this is a 32 megabyte line. 
here 64 megabyte line and here uh, 120 megabyte line in uh, vertical lines in vertical lines as I said okay so I would like to pay attention to the unit it is not gigabyte right you have gigabyte systems as your smartphone 16 gigabytes or uh, 32 gigabytes 64 gigabytes or even 128 gigabytes so it was just one thousandth of uh, the systems you have today the memory capacity was much much smaller in those days okay so um, let's assume you had 32 megabyte memory what was the recording time of the audio assuming that we had 96 kilobit per second as the compression ratio okay look at this intersection which corresponds to 24 minutes Okay, because this is the 30 minute line, this is the 60 minute line, this is the 90 minute line. So in those days, even after compression, you could store up to only 24 minutes. If you listen to your music on your way to your office or to, to the university, after 24 minutes, you have listened to it. And even if you wanted to listen to something else, you need to replace the memory. That was not long enough, okay? But it was okay in those days because we just wanted to show the feasibility. We wanted to show that it is possible. You can design and implement it. We, we just wanted to show the possibility, all right? So uh, this slide shows subjective evaluation results by MPEG-1 audio. You may wonder how good was the signal quality, the audio quality. Uh, it shows it. So uh, here along the horizontal axis, I have uh, uh, coding algorithms, MPEG-1, uh, MPEG-1 layer 1, layer 2, and layer 3. We actually used layer 2 because uh, it was a good compromise uh, between the quality and the simplicity or the ease of implementation. So uh, when you apply 96 kilobit per second as the compression ratio, it is here. So the vertical axis corresponds to the quality of the sound. Five is as, as good as the original signal. So there is no degradation. Very good. And 0, 0.0, very bad. Uh, three, it's so-so. OK, or something like that. OK, so if uh, the score is higher than four, within this uh, five-point uh, grade uh, uh, evaluation scale, that's quite good. And actually, the, uh, the score given by this uh, MPEG-1 layer 2 technology was 4.2 or 3. So it was sufficiently good. That's what is shown here. So these uh, uh, models are the three generations of the silicon audio we developed in mid-90s. The leftmost one here is uh, the first generation developed in early 1994. And uh, mid here is late 1994 version. Uh, rightmost here is the 1997 model. This is a memory card we were using in those days. The size of this memory card is your credit card size. So you can easily imagine how big it is. <laughs> okay? So let me talk first about the first uh, version developed in early 1994. Uh, we had to implement it with a general purpose digital signal processor. And uh, we actually wrote a code for this uh, software programmable chip to uh, decode the compressed audio data stored in this memory card. Because it, uh, we used just a general purpose uh, discrete devices. It's this big. In addition, we could not accommodate the batteries in it. So we had two uh, supplying connectors here and here. One is for DC 5 volts. The other one is for DC uh, 15 volts. DC 15 volts uh, was used for analog processing after uh, D2A conversion to drive the analog amplifier for your uh, headphones or earphones like this. And the DC 5 volt was mainly used for digital uh, signal processing. So even if it was big like this, we could not put uh, batteries inside. 
However, we could solve uh, that problem in the second model here. Now, we developed by ourselves in the company, NEC Corporation, for a uh, uh, dedicated audio decoding chip, as I will show you later. So now it's not a general purpose, it's a dedicated processor. It's much, much smaller than the general purpose uh, processor, actually uh, smaller than one-fourth of uh, the general purpose signal processor, so that we had space for batteries. Uh, we used to have uh, four um, metal uh, hydride uh, batteries, which looked like uh, chewing gum. That was the second version, but we also used the same memory card. This is even uh, smaller. Uh, we used the same decoding chip, but uh, there, there were more integrated parts in it from a viewpoint of integration. So that's why the size is almost as big as the memory card. Okay, so uh, the, the, the advantages of the silicon audio is, or all solid plate uh, state audio player include all these things. Uh, the biggest point is that because it is implemented totally by semiconductors, it's shock free, it's vibration free. Even if you have any shock or vibration, there is no chance of uh, skipping of the mu music signal so that you can apply it to uh, cars like this or you can use it while you are jogging or you can uh, use it while you're skiing or riding on a bike or even roller skating or uh, aerobics dancing. So that was the biggest um, benefit of uh, the old solid state system. Uh, it was in, in important to uh, design a good task distribution between uh, two chips. Actually, we had uh, two chips in the first generation. Uh, there was, a, as I said, a general purpose signal processor. Uh, there was one uh, more chip which handles bit stream and packing and also error detection. So there were two chips in it. Uh, the signal processor uh, was used for most of the decoding process. Uh, the other chip called the BSD or a bit stream uh, decoder uh, was, was to unpack bit stream and also uh, detect errors. So this shows a block diagram of the silicon audio first, first generation. Um, here we have a general purpose digital signal processor and here we have a bit stream uh, decoder uh, or a BSD. So there are there are chips, but uh, otherwise it's very simple. Uh, in addition to these two chips, uh, we have uh, uh, data conversion from uh, parallel to serial and the counter. We have the digital audio interface, uh, DA converter uh, to drive amplifier for your earphones. So it was very simple. And uh, uh, print circuit board uh, looked like this. This is a top view. This is a bottom view, you inserted a memory card here in the bottom, and then on top you can see many discrete, discrete uh, uh, components. This is a general purpose signal processor which is about uh, 25 millimeters by 25 millimeters. It was not small. Uh, this is uh, another chip, a uh, bitstream decoder. So uh, the specification was uh, the bitrate. Uh, we applied was 96 kilobit per uh, channel. Implementation was uh, uh, done by one general purpose digital signal processor plus one uh, more gate array chip. Uh, this DSP was a 24 bit fixed point uh, arithmetic. The size uh, was about 13 centimeters, 10 centimeters, and 3 centimeters, weighing, uh, no, there is no weight. The recording time, if you had uh, 16 megabyte memory was uh, 12 minutes. If you had the twice as big size, like uh, 32 megabytes, it was 24 minutes. This shows a block diagram of the silicon audio, second generation. So it is much simpler because we developed a special purpose or dedicated uh, LSI chip like this. 
So it's much simpler. You simply need that, uh, another uh, random access memory here, address control uh, mechanism here, data conversion from parallel to serial. That's it. And then digital audio converter uh, followed by an uh, analog amplifier before your headphones. So the algorithm and the other things are the same. The only difference is here we developed a dedicated uh, audio decoding chip called the MUPD uh, 6312 uh, and some peri peripheral um, components. The size is smaller, about uh, 13 centimeters by 8 centimeters by 2, two centimeters. The capacity or the recording time was uh, the same. Now, features of the decoder LSI, I said that we developed uh, dedicated LSI. The features are like this. Uh, you can decode uh, MPEG-1 layer 1 or 2, or even MPEG-2 uh, layer 2 uh, bitstream. All bit trades were uh, available in the system except free format. The sampling frequency uh, available on this chip were uh, 16, 22, 24, 32, 44, and uh, 48. So it's quite versatile. It could uh, handle stereo mode, uh, dual channel mode, joint stereo mode, or even monorail uh, representation. Uh, the package was uh, 100 pin uh, quad uh, flat package, and the power supply was 5 volt. Consumption was about 350 milliwatt. So this is a, a photomicrograph of uh, the decoder chip. If you uh, magnify the chip, it looks just like this. Uh, these are the memory sections within the, uh, this LSI, and all these things uh, form uh, the wiring and uh, uh, yes, things like that. From outside, it looks like this. Uh, as I said, it has uh, 100 uh, um, pins or interfaces like this, so you, you can uh, access the chip with 24 uh, input terminals, uh, 25 input terminals here, and the 25, 25, 25, all together, 100 uh, pins. All right, this is a PCB, or a print circuit board of the silicon audio decoder second generation. This is a to uh, top view, this is a bottom view. Uh, you are memory card should go into this slot. Now you can see, except this dedicated audio chip, there are a much smaller number of discrete parts on the board. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about challenges towards successful product. I have talked about uh, some prototypes, generation one and generation two, but it was not that simple to make it as a product which can be put into the market. So the first pri uh, point was memory price. In those days, one megabit of erasure and the write uh, ROM, read on only memory, was $30, 30 US dollars. Even if read only memory cost 63 cents, 63 US dollar cents. That was not small enough because the, this price is for only for one megabit. It's very small. However, uh, as you can easily recall, the price for the memory chips kept declining. So in the late 90s, there were uh, some small companies uh, which put their players in the market, mainly in Korea and Singapore, Se like uh, Sehan Information Systems, Diamond Multimedia, Digital Cast, Raincom, Creative, and other Japanese consumer pro uh, manuf product manufacturers like Sony, Aiwa, Toshiba, Matsushita, Panasonic, and Sanyo. They followed these uh, uh, Korean companies and the Singaporean companies. The second challenge was Copyright protection. So I, I, I would like to say that memory price problem was automatically solved because the price kept continuously kept down to a sufficiently lower, uh, low level. The second challenge was copyright protection. Copyright protection uh, controls uh, copying of the 
audio data written on the chip. So you need to have some uh, protection mechanism. Uh, all these companies uh, actually talked with um, content providers, mainly record, record companies uh, who have the audio data. However, they had to use one common system with many companies. So they need to talk with many companies, but it was not easy to agree with just one common system for copyright protection. Apple was very smart. They talked only one company, if I remember correctly, in UK, which was a big uh, record company. And then they agreed on the system. And they just started the business. If there is a business already available, other contents providers, record companies, they should follow. Otherwise, they would lose the market. So Apple was very smart. They have done the right thing. Okay, Apple tried one on one so that they were the first to succeed and they could provide one stop shopping by so called iTunes Music Store, which is now called the uh, iTunes Store. Right? So Apple was successful. The third point was uh, content distribution. In those days, it was not possible to simply download the music because there was not such a system. Today, you can uh, go to uh, Apple's uh, iTunes store or other uh, place to download the, the encoded or compressed audio data. So Apple was also uh, successful because they started iTunes uh, music store. That was a place for one-stop shopping. Otherwise, before that time, you what you had to do is to buy CDs, compact discs, and download or extract the data from these CDs into your PC, apply software encoder to data, to compress the data, and then copy the compressed data onto your memory card. That's what you had to do before uh, the days of iTunes Music Store. So from these two points, copyright protection and the contents distribution, Apple was very smart. And that's probably why Apple was the first or the giant in this market. OK, so this shows a memory price reduction with time. It was very expensive, as I said, in uh, 1990. It was more than $100 per one megabyte. One megabyte, not gigabyte, one, more than $100. Who, wanted to, uh, who wants to pay for it? only for 100 megabyte, okay? But it kept going down like this. So uh, this is the time when we developed the Silicon Audio, but still the price was something like uh, uh, 12, uh, 20, $20 per one megabyte. So it was not uh, cheap enough. Actually, uh, in those days, we predicted this line because we knew that the price has been decreased like this. On this straight line, we simply extended. We just extrapolated this line so that the price will be smaller and low, lower enough, low enough in 2000 to reach $1 per one megabyte. So that was what we expected. And uh, actually, it was. Look at this. In 2000, year 2000, it's about $1. And in uh, 2010, it's even cheaper, cheaper than $0.01. That means cheaper than one US dollar cent. OK? So the memory price problem has been solved this way. Um, this slide shows uh, how our silicon audio was uh, reported. This is the most. Uh, uh, we know magazine, Time magazine, uh, published in New York, U.S. Uh, it's July 17, 1995 issue reported our development of the Silicon Audio with this space as a future audio. This slide shows uh, the third generation of Silicon Audio. It's even smaller. You can see how small it is com by comparing uh, the size of this with this uh, memory card which is the credit card size. 
inside it looks like this. Um, here is a dedicated audio decoder chip. And the batteries become also smaller. Here, there is only one battery, which is very similar to what you have in your smartphone handset. Okay? This is uh, yet another model, uh, which provides a, a view inside uh, through the shell. So uh, you can uh, easily imagine what is uh, done inside. Okay, this is uh, uh, actually uh, one of the products provided by NEC Corporation. We were not successful in commercial product, but actually we put uh, this product in the market, which did not sell well. We put this, uh, this product only in the, in the European market. Uh, this is called the Audio Key MP3 player. Uh, the memory size was uh, 256 megabyte uh, for this model, but also uh, this, this says 256, also 128 mega and uh, 512 uh, mega models were available in the market. Okay, now uh, it is quite natural once you have implemented something for audio, you would like to extend it to video, right? We did it. Okay, so uh, we developed the two models called the Silicon View for the video signal with audio. Uh, one is a portable model here, and the other one is a handheld model. Uh, the screen size is the main difference. In the handheld model, the screen size was about 2 inches. In the portable model, the screen size was about 5.5 inches. Uh, because the portable model was much bigger, uh, it weighed uh, much heavier, about 1 kilo. Wow, that's very heavy. Handheld model was about 300 grams. Uh, look at this, the recording time of the video signal was only 4 minutes, even if we had 40 megabyte memory card. That is bigger than 32 megabyte. Okay, so video usually signals um, takes much uh, bigger amount of information. All right, so I'm showing something similar here for the video signal. Again, this is the memory capacity in megabit, but uh, uh, these uh, green vertical lines are easier for you to understand. 32 megabyte, 64, and 128. Here is a 16 megabyte line. So the blue line here is the recommended audio plus video format. The video format uh, has 352 by 240 pixels. So this is a good quality video. But in this case, if you had 32 megabyte memory card, you could store. This is 30 minutes. This is 10 minutes. Only four minutes you can store. It is possible to decimate video signal so that uh, the videos have only 176 by 120 pixels. It's not fine, as fine as this one, but you can reduce the amount of information. But even with this, you can still record it up to eight minutes, too small for you, from a viewpoint of commercial product. And then, instead of using video signal, you may use uh, continuous still images so that it may look like moving. So that's called a still image or a motion uh, video. In that case, the recording time becomes slightly more than uh, 20 minutes. But in this case, the quality of the video is not that good. So it was not practical in those days because of the constraint on the memory capacity. All right, now uh, it's time to look at the block diagram of Silicon View. Again, we developed a dedicated chip, decoder chip, for audio plus video. This is a new chip. Without this chip, it was not possible to implement such a small prototype. It was made possible by this dedicated chip called the MUPD-61010. Uh, so this shows a portable model weighing uh, about one kilo. This is a handheld model weighing uh, 300 grams. Uh, look at this. This is a memory card so that you can easily imagine how big it was. Uh, this model is with a 2-inch uh, LCD or liquid crystal display here. 
Now, uh, the print circuit boards of these systems look, look to, like this. Here is a dedicated uh, video and the audio decoding chip, mu pd 610 uh, This is a portable model, and the same chip uh, is located here. But uh, you see, uh, the print circuit boards look very simple. There are not many discrete components on it. Highly integrated system. Now, this is the specification of this AV decoding chip, MUPD61010. Uh, the video decoding was possible at uh, 30 hertz. You can uh, decode uh, 352 pixel by 240 pixel. Uh, if you go uh, to a lower rate, you can uh, decode even more fine, much finer uh, video format. Audio decoding, this is uh, uh, the same as the previously uh, introduced audio uh, dedicated decoding chip. The maximum operating frequency of this AB decoding chip was uh, 27 megahertz. The package was 160 pin. So it's, uh, it's slightly bigger than the audio chip. Uh, so in, uh, it is surrounded by 160 pins. Uh, the power supply was uh, 5 volt. The consumption was 1.7 watts. Now, um, we also developed uh, some similar terminals for uh, possible future applications. Uh, this one is called uh, uh, Silicon Guide, uh, the handheld model. It's, it's a big one. It was used to uh, show you the details of uh, exhibits in a museum or exhibition. So that was the purpose of this. Uh, uh, guiding terminals. There was uh, also an audio-only model, which was uh, smaller than this, but you could not see the video. Now, this was yet another uh, prototype for another application called uh, shopping navigation. What you can do here is to uh, push one of these three buttons, named the A, B, and C, and then when you press one of these buttons, there will be a program reproduced uh, according to the button you have pressed. So you may put uh, three different uh, contents in it. Um, the recommended product today, the cheapest one in this month, and the most popular one, for example. And then when you press one of them, the, each content comes up in the screen and uh, in related information is uh, uh, reproduced. Now, let me talk about the impact of the silicon audio on feasibility. Okay, so uh, again, this is a, a Time Magazine cover. Uh, there was yet another machine in uh, magazine in UK called Future Music. Uh, it reported the development of uh, silicon audio featuring uh, this picture. It's very interesting. Uh, they put it uh, on the cover page saying, goodbye CDs, question. And now everybody knows that, uh, yeah, everybody has said, goodbye CDs. Most of the people, I don't know what to do. Uh, do you enjoy uh, streaming music here, like Spotify or Apple Music? Or do you still uh, purchase CDs? I see. Do, do you have a, a streaming service here? Oh, you do? Good. Um, so uh, that means everybody has said goodbye to uh, CDs, okay? Graduated. Yeah, graduated. So uh, there were more reports in uh, Japan, UK, US, and UK, uh, major uh, newspapers in Japan and in the US, the Financial Times and the International Herald Tribune, and even more reported uh, in addition to uh, radio uh, news and the TV uh, reports. I actually appeared in uh, NBC News in the U.S. on the day of PR. Uh, they, they had a studio in Japan, in Tokyo, so I went to the studio and I was uh, uh, on air in the U.S. And then I was also invited to San Francisco for uh, cable TV. I also uh, appeared in uh, uh, TV, uh, I'm sorry, it's cab cable TV in Australia. Now, uh, let's see the Silicon View and uh, its family, original Silicon View, portable model, handheld model. 
It's an extension to a guide terminal, silicon guide, audio only model, and the shopping navigation. We developed all these in uh, the, uh, the 90s. We also had the full page app in the uh, biggest uh, or most popular newspaper in Japan called the Nikkei. This is a, a newspaper about uh, uh, economy. Uh, the P, uh, ad here says, first in the world, no tape, no motor, the future portable video. So it's uh, actually it was uh, implemented as a, uh, one of the versions of uh, iPod in uh, later days. Okay, so what is the impact of the silicon audio um, on production? All right, so this is the Sony Walkman, and we developed all these. Now, the decoder is much simple because it's based on the old digital technology. You need that only decoder comprising only with peri peripherals and also one LSI, decoding LSI which can be purchased from the market. So it's very simple. Uh, we, we wanted to have encoder too, but uh, it was not possible to perform encoding and decoding in a single chip in, the, in those days because of the uh, constraint of the number of uh, processings. So in early 90s, the first version looked like this. This is the second version, but this is much smaller than this, so it's simpler because of uh, this dedicated audio decoding chip. So that means when you compare the first version and the second version, less parts in the new version. And the assembly is very, very simple in this case. All they have to do is to place discrete parts, including the dedicated LSI chip, on the PCB board. And then what you do is to float it on the soldier so that it is automatically wired on the other side of the PCB board. There is no integral process based on long and extended assembly experience needed. That means anybody can enter the manufacturing business. So that is a manufacturing revolution. Okay? Anybody can start manufacturing business by simply purchasing a small number of discrete components. That's why there were new companies expanded in early stage, like uh, Korean companies and the Singaporean countries, uh, companies, as I already mentioned. So something similar. Okay, this is the first uh, commercial product by uh, Sehan Electronics called the uh, MP-MAN. This is the first generation iPod. So uh, an interesting thing to note here is that Something similar is happening in the automobile industry. This is a Toyota, one of the Lexus models. This is based on fossil fuels like gas and diesel, right? These are new cars made by Tesla, U.S. Uh, biggest uh, uh, e-car manufacturer. This is a Chinese manufacturer, Baidu, okay? In these, case, in these car cases, it's very simply simple to assemble because in these e-cars, all you need is a motor and batteries. You don't need any transmission. Okay, so that's why it's very simple. So very similar to this, in the analog Sony Walkman, you had to have very uh, long and accumulated experience to adjust all small parts. When it comes to digital, all they have to do is to get discrete parts, put it on the white uh, print circuit board, and uh, float it on the soldier. That's it. So it's very similar to the revolution in the auto industry. It's interesting to note. And the impact of the silicon audio on personal information devices. So MP-MAN, the first product, came up in 1998. This is uh, by uh, Korean company, Sihan uh, Electronics, first commercial solid-state audio player. And then iPod appeared in 2001 as MP3 plus hard disk drive. So there is still some mechanical moving part. So this is not all solid-state. iPod new version appeared in 2004, 
uh, MP4 was used, but still there was a hard disk drive, so it was not completely uh, solid state. In 2005, they released iPod Nano, which was the perfect all solid state model based on MP4 technology and flash memories in it. And then iPhone came up in 2007, which is a, an integration of an audio player and a modem, communication modem, to connect it to the communication network. Okay, so that's what a smartphone is. And then um, now smartphone is a commodity and uh, most promising these days. Uh, people wanted a bigger screen, so that was the motivation for Apple to develop iPad. Uh, released in 2010, and this is actually an upscale iPhone with larger display. Yes, what it is, and compromise between smartphone and uh, personal computers. It is also possible to go in the other direction to make it smaller so that it fit on your wrist. Uh, wrist, I'm sorry. So that is a uh, uh, smartwatch, like uh, the first version was uh, iMWatch, uh, released in 2012 followed by Apple Watch in uh, late in the same year. So iPhone minus display minus keyboard. That's smart smartwatch. Okay. Let's look at it in this uh, uh, history chart. First, uh, uh, there was a smart uh, Walkman by Sony released in 1979. And then uh, it was uh, completely digitized or uh, semiconductorized in 1994 by our prototype called the Silicon Audio. We also introduced its uh, uh, video version in 1995 as Silicon View. And then there was a first, first commercial product, MP-MAN model MPF10. And then iPod came up in 2001 based on MP3 technology and then in 2004, I bought AAC version, but still it was not all solid state, as I mentioned. And then in 2005, this was the first all solid state audio player by Apple, uh, that's iPod Nano. And then uh, there was a video version of iPod in the same year, 2005. Following this, it was possible to integrate a mobile phone handset and the audio player to make a smartphone released in 2007 as iPhone 3. And then it extended its screen to a larger one so that it was iPad in uh, 2010. And then in the other direction, there was a smartwatch. The first one was uh, iMWatch, released in 2012. <coughs> NEC also had uh, its own product here, released in uh, 2003, Audio Key, but it was not successful from a viewpoint of commercial product. Why? Maybe because the uh, content delivery system and uh, uh, copyright management. And then it continues to the future. Nobody knows uh, what happens next. Okay, so this uh, concludes my talk. I have talked about uh, the Silicon Audio mainly. It's the origin of personal information devices uh, and uh, developed in uh, 1994. It's, wow, 25 years ago. Um, upon encounter of the compression ratio going down and also increasing memory capacity on the single chip. That was the uh, background of uh, this uh, development. And then it continues to uh, its video version, the Silicon View, and then integrated with a modem to uh, become a smartphone, and then iPad, and then uh, uh, smartwatch. Okay, that is the uh, uh, history. I also pointed out that the, the development of silicon audio uh, caused um, manufacturing revolution. Anybody can purchase discrete parts and it's very easy to assemble it. And I also pointed out the same thing is happening in the uh, car manufacturing industry. Okay, so uh, the silicon audio can be uh, considered as a precursor of uh, MP-MAN and iPod and it's origin of today's smartphone handset, iPad, and also smartwatch. Thank you very much for your attention. If you had uh, any question, I'd be happy to answer.